Morning, everyone. And a big warm welcome to the One Public Estate Programme Bid Writing Workshop. It's really great to see so many of you have been able to join us today. We've had over 150 Eventbrite uh, applications, which is fantastic. So thank you very much. As an introduction, my name is Chris Watts, and I am the One Public Estate Regional Programme Manager for the Southwest Region, and I'll be chairing this workshop today. If you have the first slide, please, Penny. The first slide sets out the workshop agenda that includes an overview of the One Public Estate Phase 9 funding criteria and the self and custom build funding criteria. The presentations will also include some top tips on how to submit a funding application that is concise, clearly structured with well-referenced proposals. We will then have a presentation from the National Right to Build Task Force on the self and custom build delivery before we move into a questions and answers session. You will all note that your Zoom access has been muted. Please post any questions through the Zoom chat function and we will pick up as many questions as possible under the questions and agenda, questions and answers agenda slot later. You'll note also that the, the workshop is also being recorded and a copy of the recording will be circulated through the One Public Estate Partnership Programme Managers. Next slide, please, Penny. As an overview, the workshop will cover the 6 million One Public Estate Phase 9 revenue grant funding to support cross public sector land projects. And it will also include 20 million One Public Estate capital grant funding. And that is to enable the release of local authority land for the delivery of self and custom built housing. Applications for this funding will need to be submitted to the One Public Estate Programme by 23.59 hours on Monday, the 8th of November, 2021. Please note, bids posted after this deadline will not be accepted. Without further ado, I will now pass you to Kath Camroy. Kath is the One Public Estate Regional Programme Manager for the North East. And Kath will lead us through the One Public Estate Phase 9 criteria and some top tips. Over to you, Kath, thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, just to say welcome, as Chris said, um, to this morning's workshop. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And we look at, like we've got a really good attendance here, so that's absolutely great. Uh, some, of, some of you know, um, I'm Kath Conroy, uh, one of the two regional program managers for the Northeast, Yorkshire and Humber, mm -hmm. and the East Midlands. So I'm gonna run through, as Chris said, just some of the key bid criteria, uh, some top tips, and highlighting the differences this time round in this funding round. So as Chris said, the six million revenue funding, which we're looking for projects to support public sector property-based projects that demonstrate that critical collaboration across local central government and the wider public sector. And just to say also that to reiterate that our core OP ethos, which many of you will be aware of, I know, remains in that we are a locally led program bringing uh, national and local public sector partners together to address shared priorities through collaborations. So that's absolutely critical, that collaboration element. So we want, we're looking for projects that contribute to our core program outputs of homes, jobs, capital receipts, reduced running costs, with a particular focus on projects which include housing benefits, and also we have um, a particular emphasis in this round to seek out projects that support the government's commitment to levelling up the country. Um, so that could be, for example, through a project which may lead to or support creating jobs in an area of high unemployment, for example. So what can the funding be used for? It can be used to support early stage project costs, such as master planning feasibility studies. It can't be used for things such as planning application fees, legal fees, etc. In past funding rounds, the funding has, uh, the programme has supported a number of cross public sector priorities, such as joined up um, public services, such as housing, health and social uh, care integration, and such as regeneration and supporting net zero carbon ambitions. Uh, now, looking at now the differences in uh, this round, 
So two main differences, one of which is that there is now a minimum project award of 50,000. So it may be that you'd want to consider packaging a number of smaller schemes together if you need to, um, to hit that 50K target. Um, you might want to pack the, package them together in terms of a place-based or a theme-based programme of work. So in addition, programme management funding is also available. Obviously, the programme recognises the importance of robust and dedicated programme management in uh, supporting delivery of projects within partnerships. Um, we would, however, ask you to speak and discuss with this if you have an interest in it uh, with your regional team. So coming on to the second and the most significant difference um, in this funding round is that we'll be seeking a minimum proportion of 75% sustainable grant within every bid. Now the 75% we're looking for is across an overall partnership basis. So it may be that a partnership may have a portfolio of projects which range from projects that are more than 75 sustainable grant and less. So it's that overall thing that we'd stress. It's the overall partnership basis that is that 75% minimum portion of sustainable grant. Now, the reason for the sustainable grant, obviously, as I'm sure you all appreciate, is that we're seeking to make the very best use of public funding in terms of recycling that funding and enabling, once it's recycled, for that funding to come back into the programme nationally to then go on to be able to support future projects across the country into the future. So that's kind of reasoning behind it, as I'm sure you all appreciate. Another difference this time round, in order to uh, recognise the um, the nature of uh, property projects by the very nature are very complex. There's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of partners, assets, uh, policies, priorities, etc. In order to recognise that, the, um, the trigger point for repayment or recycling of that funding this time round is linked to a trigger milestone rather than it being time bound to a specific date in time. So in terms of um, that trigger milestone might be, say, for example, disposal of an asset, it might be a lease event, it might be um, a co-location for whatever. So once that trigger milestone has been hit, then that triggers the recycling of funding to come back into the national programme. Also be mindful of the fact that um, should, for whatever reason, it may be there may be changes for whatever reason um, if that trigger milestone isn't achieved then there will be an there will be no expectation that the recycling of funding will come back in just finally um, it's really crucially important that um, there are a range of asset owners public and local public sector partners in involved in in the projects coming forward and that we need to ensure that or you you need to ensure in your bids that um, you have the support of all of those asset owning partners so next slide please penny thank you um, so just moving on to the criteria um, as you'll see we the, the criteria and we've identified the scoring which is going to be applied to each of the criteria pre-selection criteria is really important please don't forget that um, the, the, the effective cross public sector board operation of and all of those other things that are in there that you'd be familiar with from previous rounds. But please, as I say, do remember that they are important and you must address them in your application form. One thing just to flag that's different, I think, this time around is that we're requiring a statement of commitment for public sector equality duty. And that's you'll find that in the application form. Again, that's really important that all of those things are addressed and included in the application form. Strategic case, 40%, you'll see that that's really, really important. I can't stress enough how important it is that partners take the time to, um, to really think that through and really pull together um, a convincing and compelling case um, for the assessment panel to be able to show um, how your project supports local, regional and national objectives, such as levelling up in particular, how the project supports creation of economic uh, opportunities um, and the degree to which it supports innovation, um, align, alignment with, as I say, local and um, 
national priorities such as net zero carbon, for example, 40% is a massive, uh, massive chunk of, of, of the marks. Then the other four criteria, as you'll see, are of equal weighting. Um, so the level of cross public sector involvement, who else is involved, um, who are the partners, how are they involved, what their assets are, and how respectively the partners will benefit from this particular project. Be very, very clear in articulating that. Again, add value from our funding, and apologies if you can hear, I've got some works just started outside, so I'll speak loudly, and I do apologise if it's interfering with the sound. Um, how does our funding help, enhance, um, what, what would happen if our funding wasn't there? Does it in, increase the scope uh, of, of the project, for example? Be very clear in articulating that in your bid. Um, value for money. What, what benefits is the public purse getting out of investing in your project? Again, be very clear about the benefits that, 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 and therefore the value for money that that represents. Um, so also um, confidence in delivery. So confidence not only in, in the, the, the ability of your partnership to deliver. So um, what, what have you done before to track record? Um, how, how can you instill confidence in your bid that the assessment panel can see that your partnership can really deliver this project. And also the project itself, um, engendering um, a confidence that you can deliver this particular project and any, any work that you've done to, um, to be able to ensure that that's the case. So next slide, please, Penny. Thank you. Um, so at the application form itself, two parts, um, the basic details form, um, so that is one per partnership, and that's to be submitted by the lead authority. So that is included to include all the details, benefits, all project details, forecast benefits, details of the partnership, um, and also a checklist, which is actually really helpful to be able to go through just before you submit your bid um, uh, to make sure that you've actually picked up and you've included everything that you need to do. Secondly, an application form, we're looking for one per project, um, so there could be one basic details form per, per partnership, and there might be underneath that um, a series of um, individual application forms for individual projects. Um, all the information that's required is in the application form. They're very, very straightforward. They're very clear, and they've got really good um, explanations as, as to exactly what information is required. Um, just picking out a couple in there in the list, the strategic case, making sure that that's um, the rationale, the objectives, the strategic fit, the local need and innovation, and, that's, and that golden thread that takes you from your project to um, central government priorities and how that is all aligned and linked. That's really what we're looking for. And that confidence in delivery is incredibly important. Um, so next slide, please, Penny. Thank you. Um, so just some top tips to finish. Um, so tell us your places and project story. And don't forget to answer the question that's asked, and that might sound a bit silly, but actually it's surprising the number of times that that doesn't happen and that things go off on a tangent. Be very specific and very clear that you've you've read the, the, the question and that the answer you're providing hits all of those things that are being asked for. As I say, the, the application form is very clear and very helpful in terms of giving you explanations as to the kinds of things that you could include in those answers. Um, Pre-selection criteria, incredibly important, make sure that you've hit those things. Um, so explaining why the funding is needed, be very clear about what funding is required, who's going to be used for, and for um, what would happen if it wasn't there. Public sector partners, again, be very clear about the public sector partners that are involved, what their involvement is and where the benefits will fall, and that they have and they are supportive of it. Uh, strategic programs again yes you can package those together deliverability make sure that you're aware and be very mindful of the fact that the assessment panel may not be very familiar with your partnership may not be very familiar with what you've done your successes and your track record so make sure that you highlight that but in a very succinct way because there's a 15 page uh, 
match the limit, which you'll have seen, I'm sure. Innovation, what you're doing differently, how you can highlight how your project stands out amongst anything else. And additional information, keep that to a minimum. And last but very least, not least, future region, regional team here to help and I'm sure would be happy to flex diaries and, and provide time and space for you to uh, to you to you to provide some information for you. So back over to Chris and I do apologize for the noise. Thank you. Thank thank you very much Kath and we we heard everything that you said. There was a little bit of a buzz in the background but it was it was good. We heard everything and um, thank you very much as well for going through what's required in the, the One Public Estate Phase 9 programme and the criteria and what's expected from all partners to deliver a successful um, application. Um, there is a couple of questions on, that have been posted and so I do apologise that the slides, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, the slides will be shared with everybody as well. As I referenced that um, a copy of this recording will be shared with the partnership programme managers but for people who um, want other access, it will be also posted on YouTube like it was last time. So if I can ask you to refer to YouTube um, in, in several days time, then you should find it on, on there. So I'm now going to pass you to um, James Bridgewood. James is the regional programme manager for the Northwest and West Midlands. And he will lead us through the self and custom build criteria and top tips. Over to you, James. Thanks very much, Chris, um, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm one of the regional programme managers and I sit in the Office of Government Property side of the team. So I'm going to run through the detail of the self and custom build criteria and requirements. This is all set out in the prospectus on our website, um, along with some frequently asked questions and the application forms and the annexes are all aligned with these key criteria. So the, the overview first, there's 20 million pounds of capital funding available to help bring forward local authority land on which self and custom build homes will be built. All English local authorities are eligible and for this round that includes all of the mayoral combined authorities and their constituent local authorities. And it's for any local authority land. So, so both Greenfield and Brownfield sites we will consider. The funding's designed to help address viability issues and a funding gap associated with abnormal costs. So that's not an exhaustive list on the screen, but it could include groundworks or small scale infrastructure. And for these self and custom build projects um, could also include the servicing to the self and custom build plots themselves. Your, your application throughout should clearly identify the specific capital costs which you require the grant for. The application must also clearly articulate why government funding intervention is required, that there's a funding gap, that there's a market failure, and by market failure what we mean is that the market cannot achieve an efficient outcome. So in the, safe, in the case of self and custom build plots, uh, that will occur where there's a need to provide uh, remediation works or, or infrastructure that no house builder would be able or willing to fund to make the land suitable for housing. Equally, you as landowners will have deemed those, those, those elements too costly yourselves um, and therefore a funding gap is created which leaves the site stalled with no prospect of, of being released for housing. A clear, um, a clear indication of market failure is when the site has been tested in the market itself. However, we're not expecting that to be the case for all projects. So think about how you can evidence by means of a development appraisal or residual valuation, for instance, which shows a gap that aligns with the funding you're requesting. There's great breadth and opportunity to provide self and custom build sites. So, so just a few examples of, of what we've seen come forward previously. Uh, garage sites, car parks, former town halls, community centres, scrubland, former school sites, and, and the delivery and the tenure models vary as well. Uh, so we've been seen projects that deliver affordable housing, um, that are community led, um, that partner with private sector partners, um, that address your self and custom build housing list, 
um, and also some projects that provide key worker housing, for instance. And, and many of the schemes are using innovative delivery models, such as modern methods, modern methods of construction um, and a building to high energy efficiency standards. A, a key element of this funding is that the land must be released for housing by September 2024. Um, so, so they're, they're for land release, potential land release triggers, which are, which are detailed there. Um, and ultimately for self and custom build, um, this, this covers the eventuality of exchange of contract, exchange of contracts on the first plot if none of the others are met by virtue of your project's delivery route. So again, all of, all of those, those are, are in the prospectus and in the FAQs um, and will circulate the slide pack. So, so think about which of those milestones your project will meet by September 2024. If we could move on, please, Penny. So um, this, uh, this slide shows the, the six key assessment criteria for self and custom build. First of all, the gateway criteria really important, as, as Kath said, for OPE, equally for self and custom build. Um, so there's got to be capital works on local authority owned land for which there is a clear and evidenced market failure and which enable release of the land by September 2024, all of that stuff that, that I've just described. Um, also, the, the project must achieve a benefits cost ratio score of one or more and a score of benefit cost ratio plus non-monetized benefits of 1.5 must be reached. So I'm going to talk about um, BCRs and, and non-monetized benefits in more detail shortly. The first of the, the scored uh, criteria um, is value for money. Um, and I'm gonna pick up on this in a bit more detail. Um, that's got a number of component parts. So the benefit cost ratio, the non-monetized benefits, so as well as gateway criteria, non monetized benefits and BCRs act as a scored part of the assessment. And in addition, the value for money includes an assessment of the gross value added per hour worked for your locality. So, so more to come on that. Um, the next scored criteria at 30% um, is the strategic case. So here's here what's what's really important to convey is is the rationale for the project in in terms of both national government priorities, for instance, leveling up, um, and in that instance, um, we'd be keen you describe the the geographic inequality which the investment helps address. Um, so that could be deprivation in the locality of the housing that you're intending to uh, release land for, for instance. Um, Really important also, though, is, is how it addresses local priorities. So the project's impact on place, the locality, the community, and why you need capital funding now in order to accelerate the project or to cover the funding gaps in the overall project. Applications um, could also show how the project will help to meet uh, local housing requirements for the local area. Um, how it supports local employment, how it supports local suppliers, for instance. We're also really keen to promote exemplars of self and custom build delivery um, in a variety of different settings. So, so think about what's special about your project and, and how your project could act as an exemplar. Moving on um, to um, the, the third scores criteria, which is the deliverability assessment. So this is about giving assessors confidence in delivery of your project and, and really importantly, confidence that land will be released against those, those milestones by September 2024. There are some uh, predetermined milestones within the application form. Um, and they range from um, procurement of, of, of advice uh, right through to um, the, the land release date. So when you're hitting that milestone that we've discussed and then the expected start on site for the new homes and the development ending. 
Um, there is opportunity for you to include other milestones on the application forms though, so, so please do include those other milestones as you see appropriate. In terms of deliverability, the, the planning status is also a really important part of our delivery assessment, um, particularly making clear whether planning is a dependency for the funded works and the land release. We'll also take into account um, the key risks um, and the mitigation which you describe. Um, and, and there's a note there, so, so evidence of, of costed work and development appraisals will help support a number of the criteria. Um, so it will help evidence the gap, it will help evidence the funding need, um, but, but such evidence will also give confidence to assessors in the preparatory work which you've, you've already undertaken. Uh, second to last, um, so um, at 5%, uh, there's, a, there's an assessment criteria for innovation. Here, here think about how the project could be perceived, um, perceived as innovative or perceived as an exemplar. Um, it could include, for example, construction techniques, modern methods of construction, for instance, use of sustainable materials, uh, wider sustainability and environmental impact. Um, and, and sort of housing that helps you on your route to, to a zero carbon ambition um, or quality of design. But it's not just about how the homes will be built. Um, it's also, innovation is also about your supply chains and your routes to, de deli to deliver as well. Um, so, so how you're going to use small to medium sized enterprises, for instance. And uh, finally, the, the, the sixth of the criteria is um, public sector equality duty. Um, this isn't about the council's general approach to public sector equality duty, it's, it's project specific. So projects which highlight a, a positive impact for people with protected characteristics, and those are the characteristics that are defined by the Equality Act of 2010, who struggle to obtain um, attain appropriate housing. So examples of a positive impact could include proposals to bring forward development in areas where those with protected characteristics have disproportionately own, low ownership or where they suffer disproportionately from overcrowding, for instance. Um, it could also be um, that the project will provide um, homes for those with a disability um, or that cater for a specific age group. Um, and you can also support that with evidence in terms of your housing need assessment as, as to why there's demand for those groups within your local area. If we could move on, please, Penny. Thank you. Um, so next up, as, as promised, a bit more detail about the value for money assessment. Uh, the value for money assessment comprises three component parts. So, so first is the benefit cost ratio, which is calculated in the technical annex. The, the benefit cost ratio is calculated based on the land value uplift. That calculation itself happens behind the scenes in the annex, but it's driven by the housing numbers which you profile within the table in the form against each year of delivery. And, and you can see the results that that creates in terms of benefit cost ratio. Then uh, there's the, the assessment of additionality at high, medium or low. Um, here it's, it's really important that you provide a description as to why you've chosen that level of additionality. So additionality reflects the amount of development which would have occurred in the absence of funding intervention. The higher the additionality, the more dependence both the project and overall development in the local authority is to the funding intervention. So applicants should reflect on the site specific market failures that they've identified in their selection of additionality and, and also provide accompanying narrative to support that. The uh, benefit cost ratio also takes into account any other costs to central government. So a number of you will be, be familiar with, with how these are profiled. Um, and, and this is, um, these are the central government costs in achieving the same outcome. So the land release, so the pre-development costs. 
um, you don't need to tell us about um, the cost in terms of developing once the, the land has been, you, you've reached your land release trigger. Um, remember the, the gateway criteria here. So, so projects uh, must have a minimum BCR of one. So check that when you complete the technical annex, you're, you're achieving a BCR of one or above. The second uh, component um, of uh, value for money is the assessment of non-monetized benefits. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about those on the next slide, but these are the economic or social welfare benefits which the benefit cost ratio hasn't captured. So anything other than the land value uplift, for instance. Finally, um, the, the third part of the assessment is the gross value added. Uh, you don't need to provide any information here. That's 10% of the value for money uh, score. Um, and those will be allocated uh, based on the area's relative position in terms of gross value ad added to help uh, incorporate the government's levelling up priority into our scoring for value for money. We'll, we'll do this centrally based on the local authority area. Um, but you can see where your area sits by virtue of the English average um, on the technical annex. If we could move on, please, Penny. Thank you. Um, so more detail about non-monetized benefits now. Um, the HM Treasury Green Book and the uh, DLUHC, Department of Leveling Up's appraisal guidance, provides more detail. But, but non-monetized benefits broadly fall into the categories listed here. We're also keen to understand any others which you consider, uh, consider appropriate, hence the other category. Um, and we'll score nominalized benefits based on the information you provide. Um, and that is the, the impact relative to the size of the project and also the evidence. So, so please do make sure that you provide supporting evidence for your nominalized benefits. There, there's some examples of, of normalized benefits in the prospectus and the frequently asked questions. So remember that, that the, the categories here are just categories and you need to be more specific than, than that. Um, but for instance, um, a, a brownfield site um, uh, could have visual amenity impacts for local residents. The, the site might be large, significant, vacant in a poor state of repair. Um, and um, you could provide evidence um, using photos and an indicative site plan um, to, to show that by developing the site, it will remove blight for a significant number of surrounding uh, residents. So, so that's an example of vision amenity, for instance. Um, and do also talk to your, your regional program managers about, about normal size benefits as well, and they'll, they'll be able to give you some guidance. We, we will assess your normalized benefits and we'll convert them into a maximum uplift of 0.5, which will be added to the benefit cost ratio score. Um, the, the key point to remember here is that normalized benefits serve two purposes. Um, so where your benefit cost ratio is between 1 and 1.5, normalized benefits are essential to meet the gateway criteria. Once you pass that gateway criteria, they can also improve your overall value for money score and can therefore affect the project's position in the final ranked list. Uh, projects in the last round, which tended to, to receive the highest normalized benefit score, uh, tended to include four to, to six um, NMBs per project. Um, but, but this isn't about providing response against all of the generic categories. It's about how you can demonstrate the specific project impact and provide good quality evidence for those. So, so please don't feel the need to, 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 to put something against each of those categories. Think about the project itself and the, the wider social welfare benefits. Moving on, please, Penny. So um, in, terms of, um, in terms of how to apply, uh, there, are, there are three forms for self and custom build um, applications, um, and they're all in sections which mirror the criteria which have just been described. So, so hopefully they're logical uh, when, when you read in conjunction with the prospectus. Um, I'm going to run through um, the three forms in reverse order, actually, which, which is probably the easiest way for applicants to consider them. Uh, 
first the technical annex where you need one for each project um, I'd encourage you to put your project numbers in here first to check that your project meets the BCR gateway of one. The, the form is largely formulaic based on your housing numbers and the amount of grants you're uh, applying for. But, but this is also where you select your additionality, which I mentioned earlier. So, so please do make sure that, that there's an explanation of that additionality. Uh, because assessors will um, will uh, assess that that level of, of additionality that you've chosen, um, and they may uh, reduce it um, if if we consider it's optimistic. Uh, second, uh, the application form. So again, one per project with a limit of fifteen pages. This is largely the narrative to support your application. Um, and it's designed to take you through each of the assessment criteria in turn with additional guidance within the form itself as you go. Uh, with the applications, um, please remember to get Section 151 Officer or Chief Executive sign off uh, for the local authority whose land it is. And then finally, um, the basic details form. Um, so there is one per OP partnership and what this does um, is it aggregates all of the information for the projects with which the OP partnership are going to be submitting. Um, and as with uh, the, the revenue funding application, the OP funding, um, it contains a, a checklist um, to help you just prior to submission. Moving on to the final slide, I think, Penny. Uh, so, so top, top tips. Um, this is this is really just a recap of, of, of what I've run through. So, so some reminders. Um, answer the question posed with the assessment criteria in mind. Um, we're, we're keen to understand the story, but keep it concise, keep it relevant and reflect on the prospectus guidance as you go. Um, consider your gateway first. Um, so, um, as I said, strongly encourage you to run your project numbers through the technical annex. Um, particularly important um, if you're achieving a, a, a benefit cost ratio around the one mark or indeed around the 1.5 mark. Um, so coming on to that, normalised benefits, remember that they serve two purposes. Uh, first as a gateway criteria where your BCR is falling between 1 and 1 1.5, they're critical there, so you should pay particular attention to them. And once past that point, so your BCR plus N and B of 1.5, they can affect your ranking in the final list as part of the BFM assessment. Um, so, so don't give up on NMBs once you've passed that magic 1.5. Additionality, um, so assessors, as I said, will consider your choice of high, medium or low, and it might be adjusted if it's not considered appropriate. That in turn can, of course, affect your benefit cost ratio and whether you hit the gateway of one. So, so I can't reiterate enough, make sure you're explaining why you, you choose that additionality assessment. Um, deliverability, what, what your timelines look like, what are the critical dependencies. Um, the, the aim of this is to give assessors confidence in delivery to those timescales. Have you identified the risks that we're spotting? Um, have you identified mitigation? Um, and, and have we got confidence that, that you can release the land by September 2024? And then uh, finally, public sector equality duty. Um, this isn't a generic impact assessment or council policy it's about the positive benefits which the project enables. Um, just um, uh, that wasn't finally, just in terms of additional information, uh, we'll, we'll score the criteria based on the evidence articulated within the application form, uh, but please keep additional information uh, relevant and to a minimum. So re reference that additional information with the application form. Um, and if you're linking, for instance, to lengthy strategy documents, a housing strategy, for instance, please indicate the page number and the paragraph of relevance. So assessors won't have time to read full strategy documents. Chris, I think that's that's me done for the SCB overview.
Thank you very, very much, James. That was a really clear overview of the self and custom build criteria and what's required to deliver a successful application. At this point, can I actually encourage you all to keep posting your questions through the chat? I noticed there's a number there already, but keep posting and we will pick up as many of these as we can after our next um, speaker. So I now have the pleasure to introduce you to Sally Tag. Sally is the acting head for the National Right to Build Task Force and will lead the presentation on local authority self and custom build delivery. Over to you, Sally. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, good morning, everybody. And I hope now that I can add a little bit more to everything that we've heard before. So notwithstanding, um, Penny, if you could take me to the next slide, please. I just want to touch on the government's self-build action plan. Um, this is the first time we've seen an action plan dedicated to custom self-build. And I think that there are a number of things here on the list that are um, in, in play and ongoing and, and um, are very interesting and useful to understand. But I want to focus on the Bacon Review today, which has been completed. This was um, undertaken earlier in the summer. And I think that um, for those of you who are interested, I'd like you to focus on chapter four, which is using land the public already own, and also chapter six, delivering real change that works. Um, both of those are interesting sections, so have a look at those that might well um, assist you. Next slide, Penny, please. Thank you. I want to also, in this session, look at defining self and custom build, the government aspirations for the sector, looking at diversity, placemaking. I also want to look at some of the wider benefits and obviously to take you through quickly what the right to build task force can, can assist you with. Next slide, please, Penny. Thank you. So in terms of divine, defining custom and self-build, for those of you who are not familiar, and there may be some in the audience who um, need to take a look at the legislation, we're looking at the self and custom build house building 2015 Act. Those are the two um, sections that we see in the first bullet. But the key issue really to understand is how the Act does not distinguish um, between self and custom built housing. And also, um, I think I noticed something in the chat about what, what constitutes custom and self build. Um, it's very much about a, an element of everyone needing to be involved, whether they're individuals or associations, in the process holistically. So from design stage all the way through to build stage and then subsequent occupation. Um, that is kindly the definition within the legislation which, which you need to be mindful of. There are a number of other um, elements to this in terms of different parts of legislation, secondary regulation as well, national planning policy framework for those of you who are planners. Next slide please Penny. Thank you. But I think the key message here is that the Bacon Review, which is why I'm pointing you to it, talks about a very broad church. So we have a number of issues here. We've got national planning policy framework and we've got the national um, model design code, which is quite new, all of which are salient and, and should be perhaps um, something that you refer to. So I'd like to go to the next slide now, please, Penny. Thank you. But I think it's really, really important as well that you are aware of the right to build duties on councils. Um, these are statutory requirements. So this came in in April 2016. And effectively, under the 2015 um, Act requirements, each local authority in England needs to have a self build register, enabling anyone within your borough or district to come forward and sign up to the register. Um, and identifying themselves as parties who want to build in your area. And then the registers need to be very well publicised on your council's websites. And then local authorities need to have regard for these um, uh, parties in terms of any decision making on planning, housing and land disposal in terms of your functions. And then in terms of the duty under the legislation to meet demand, Obviously, the numbers on the register need to be satisfied in terms of granting sufficient permissions to address the numbers on the register. And there is enough information on that particular element again within the legislation. Next slide, please, Penny. 
So I want to have a look now at um, how we can determine that you are confident that your bid is a custom build project um, and how, how that is addressed. So just for those of you who are perhaps new to this, custom build, self-build um, can be, you know, different things to different people, but self-build is the DIY option. Um, it's very much about people normally who have got an aspiration to do everything themselves or have got skills they want to utilise and they're effectively bringing forward their own properties with their own designs and man managing the project through from start to finish. They occasionally will bring in contractors as well, but these are typically individual self-built schemes or schemes where there's two houses on the plot. Anyone moving on to kind of larger projects, quite often we're seeing people who want to undertake their own projects, but they don't want to do the DIY option. So they're, they're taking up the custom build route. This is very much working with specialist developers who effectively enable projects. So they're helping with the design, they're helping with the delivery and all the aspects that um, everything else that needs to be undertaken. And ultimately this can then um, end up with multi-plot sites where you've got service plots that are ready, or it could just be that a home builder is, is actually doing all of the things leading up to the actual purchase of a site and construction with the enabler. But those are two different elements to just be aware of. Can we go to the next slide now, please, Penny? So I just want to touch on delivery models in a bit more detail. Um, I think we are aware of small sites, but we've also got larger sites where um, perhaps through planning policy, developers are required to deliver a percentage of housing as custom soft build. Brownfield regeneration, those, those are a kind of well worn routes for custom self-build, um, very popular, but also greenfield land. And I'm looking now particularly at the exception sites where authorities can bring forward land that are on the edge of settlements and towns that are sustainable sites, but actually are sites that are not of interest to bigger developers for market housing on the premise that they're constrained by um, things that are not in the business model for the massive house builder. So very much very good for custom and self-build. The Shropshire model is one I'm going to talk about in a moment as an example of an exception site. Um, I also wanted to just touch on the fact that community land trust and, and co-housing projects as well are of interest in terms of delivery models. I'm going to show you some examples of those in a moment. Next slide, please, Penny. Next slide. Thank you. So first of all, I just want to touch on um, Graven Hill. This is a greenfield development. I'm sure most of you um, may have heard of this in, in some form or other. This is a site that was purchased by Cherwell District Council. It's an old MOD um, facility and was brought forward for custom self-build in the main. Um, we've got a real mixture of, of different types of development on this site. And this is very much an ongoing site. If you look at the Graven Hill uh, website, you'll see a whole plethora of information, which I think would be of interest to you. Um, but really, the reason for showing you this is that this is, in England at the moment, I think our biggest custom self-build site, and probably now in Europe, I think we've overtaken uh, the Netherlands, but certainly a site uh, to be aware of um, in terms of Greenfield. And also some of the issues that are raised with the Graven Hill scheme are certainly ones that could be um, used on smaller developments for Greenfield. Moving on, please, Penny. So we're looking now at community-led um, schemes. Now, this is a co-housing co scheme for older people. And the reason I've raised this one is because this is the first senior um, co-housing community project in the country, um, very uh, aspirational for a group of uh, women who came together um, and who wanted to actually have a community supportive environment for women over 55. What was interesting about this was that they had considered open market provision and there wasn't anything that would satisfy their needs. They felt very much um, they wanted to have a, a community which could all grow old together, support each other. And so very much a community issue, but this model could be used um, through a CLT provision as well. This is a an owned and occupied scheme with some social housing. Next slide, Penny, please. 
So this is now a community-led affordable self built housing scheme. This is um, in Lewisham, 33 co-designed houses and flats. What's interesting about this is that um, this is a managed uh, scheme by Rust. It was a volunteer-led CLT. And a group of residents in Walton Way, Lewisham came together. They were seeking to ensure and future-proof for future generations the provision of housing for those that had always lived in this, in this local area. They were basically being priced out of the market and unable to continue to, to you know, move back effectively. And so as a consequence, they wanted to come up with a model that would effectively lock in affordability, future-proof it for other generations, and on that premise, um, come up with a simple and cost-effective build, um, aspirational in itself in some respects, very sustainable and also low energy. And the link for that is at the bottom of the slide, and I suggest that that would be a good one to have a look at. Moving on. Next slide, please. Thank you. I just want to have a quick look at affordable housing. So this is, um, on this slide, we've got two examples. So we've got the Shropshire model, which is basically a provision where the Shropshire Council brought forward a scheme um, which limited the size of individual um, units and also ensured that their resale value was limited to 60 to 80% open market value um, and also ensured a local connection clause. Now, the local connection clause was really a mechanism to ensure looking after their existing communities, those who lived and worked there, but also those that had connections there and wanted to come back into the community. Um, that was a very successful scheme. And subsequently, there's also um, the Teambridge scheme, which is on the link below. Again, another one to look at. But this was a really um, innovative scheme of its time. This is one that the task force uses regularly because it's one that's really worked. Moving on, please, Penny. I just want to touch on some other examples of um, custom and self-build um, opportunities. So starter homes, we have, I think fair to say across England, a dire shortage of first time starter homes. Um, many uh, youngsters desperately looking to self-build. Um, then the downsizers, we've also got that problem as well because of the demographic. Um, the other one that I just wanted to point out is the shared ownership at sweat equity uh, opportunity. So the picture at the bottom of the slide is a, a scheme in Vista, um, which was uh, through Cherwell District Council. Um, and they were working with a group of young uh, people who were wanting to get into the trades to learn carpentry, electrician, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted to um, build their own homes using sweat equity um, and in the process upskill. Um, that was a, a successful scheme and one that you know is worth perhaps looking at as a case study. Um, moving on then to our next slide, please, Penny. So I just want to have a look at the land release scheme. So what we've learned from the first round, the cascade approach, many of uh, local authorities in the first wave were taking people off their affordable housing register and delivering affordable homes with capital A, um, which is absolutely fine. But what we are also suggesting is that there is an opportunity to um, move to affordable housing open market with a small A um, and facilitating those um, who, who you know, clearly do want to undertake custom self-build. And moving on then to the registers, the issue that we're finding on registers is there are people joining registers who are um, youngsters, um, people who are in um, medium-sized family homes and uh, to a degree are trapped because they can't afford market housing to move up the ladder. And so this would be an opportunity for both those groups um, because they are not in affordable housing provision um, and are, are not uh, eligible for affordable housing registered. So we've got some parties falling between two stools there, between market and, and affordable. Um, moving on, please, Penny. So why apply? I think from our perspective as the task force, we would say that the government clearly is seeking to um, demonstrate uh, by, by this bid and this, this fund um, opportunities of diversity and enabling people to actually deliver their own homes to suit their own needs, delivering homes that are sustainable and future-proof for their needs. I think the pandemic has 
shined a big torch on all of this. Um, and so, um, you know, we see that as a, an ideal opportunity moving forward. Um, I think it's fair to say a lot of what I've said about um, things have been covered in previous presentations, but I would urge you to talk to your regional teams about difficulties that you might have or, or further information that you need. And we're as a task force here to support that as well. Moving on, Penny, please. I just want to look at some of the benefits. Um, coming from a local authority background myself, I, I do understand that sometimes trying to get buy-in in, internally um, can be an issue. And so it's really looking at some of the, the opportunities for you as authorities. Um, clearly in communities, you know, for me, community cohesion is right up there. In terms of councils, it's about accelerating the growth of housing supply and looking at opportunities to bring um, economy benefits in terms of local small developers who have struggled in the past, who've got lots of skill and lots of supply chain um, opportunities to bring people who've actually got dedicated skills like the carpenters and people like that who um, are actually really well used in custom self-build routes. The other thing as well is about um, fewer planning objections. Quite often when I'm dealing with neighbourhood plans, communities have a significant more buy-in to custom self-build um, because they see this as an opportunity to facilitate people who are already in the community or people who want to come back to community um, and downsize within communities. So often that's a, a more acceptable route. Moving on, Penny, please. I just want to re-emphasise that um, from the task force perspective, we, we don't feel that you need to have um, experience in custom self-build. In fact, we are still trying to encourage as many authorities as possible to get involved in the sector. Um, and, and so on that basis, you know, don't let it put you off if you've not previously been involved in custom self-build. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, in terms of policy, for those of you who are perhaps less familiar, there's a few here, so allocated sites um, and criteria-based support. But rather than go into detail now, if anyone wants some information regarding policies, then do um, make contact with us and we can assist you in that respect. Moving on, please. So I just now want to look at some top tips for evidence for custom self-build. Um, from a perspective of just focusing in on who your audience is for your bid. Is it the right to build register? Is it the housing register? Is it community groups? Perhaps, you know, be clear on, on that, but also consider how you can make sure you provide a good level of involvement of the end user in each of those stages that I referred to earlier. So in terms of design and build, and then ultimately occupation. Make sure that you also demonstrate with evidence how those end users have been involved in that process. That's really rather key. And that can involve a number of things, meeting notes, site visits, notes, et cetera. But a clear audit trail that you can demonstrate is, is really, really key in this respect. And also make sure that when the designs have been identified, that the parties who are involved in the process sign up to that and then you have a, a clear agreement at that stage. Penny, if you could take me to the next slide, please. So in terms of the tips for deliverability, um, I think that me wearing my planning hat for a second, planning authorities and planning departments are very much part of this process at the initial stages at least. And I think early involvement with the planning departments is important to get buy-in through the project. Um, a, probably an involvement at the, at the Bid stage even would be a good idea just to warm the, the, the offices up in your planning departments. Also, for those of you who are looking at larger sites where um, a design code is likely to be needed, then do drill down to some of the devil in the detail by looking at the text in those, those documents and how they correlate with design, imagery and diagrams, et cetera, because that can also be confusing for the implementation stage if the design codes aren't clearly written. Um, also moving on to technical reports and documents, 
I think there's lots and lots of different technical reports required through the planning process. Make sure that you've identified what those are and then also moving on to make sure they're all signed off with your planning departments. In terms of contracts, um, I think it goes without saying that key services should be part of the contract, but make sure you've identified all of the key services. It can be a complete showstopper if, for example, sewerage is missing or gas or electricity, things like that can take time to resolve and delay your project. Also make sure that your main contractor is engaged with throughout the entire process, um, particularly around expected dates for delivery of key infrastructure such as roads, Again, this can slow your project. And make sure that your formal contracts are in place with all the parties. Your legal team has had an opportunity to carefully set out and vet all of those contracts. And then finally, make sure that your bids are submitted in time. We've already heard about the window. Um, so it's a question of obviously making the best use of time going forward. Next slide, Penny. Thank you. So finally, then, to wrap up, in terms of the task force offering, we have this autumn some exciting masterclasses. These are all free to local authorities. Um, please do have a look at our website. The next one's the 14th of October, and we're looking at design codes and plot passports. So everything design related. Um, and we would welcome anyone wanting to join us. We still have capacity in that particular session, but there are more coming. Watch this space. Um, the other thing that we also offer is a very bespoke consultancy service. Um, I would say this, and I think it's uh, fair to say that we have a very um, experienced uh, task force of, of experts, um, which will range from all of the things that we've discussed today and more. And if anyone wants to take us up on any of those services, do feel free to contact us. We also have lots of free advice that's on our website uh, and which we are updating regularly. So again, keep watching that and hope that that has been of interest to you. Next slide, Penny. Thank you very much. And um, pass you back to Chris. Thank you very much, Sally, for that. And thank you for the presentation and the clear definition and examples of self-building, custom-built delivery. And also a big thank you for your offer to support the partners. So I would encourage partners to take up Sally's offer on that. Um, we are now moving into our question and answer session. Catherine Anderson, the One Public Estate Regional Programme Advisor for the Northwest and West Midlands region, and Emma Gordon, the OP Regional Programme Advisor for the Southwest, have been trawling through your questions posted in the chat and will now read out the questions and will answer or assign them appropriately. We've got about 20 minutes for this, so um, I will keep a timer on it. Thank you. Over to you, Kate and Emma. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I'm going to kick off with the OPE nine questions um, along with Kath. And we've had some really interesting questions in Kath. Um, quite a few on the 75% sustainable grant. So I'll start with those. The first one is, um, is the 75% sustainable grant element required for each project? And the answer there is, uh, no, it's expected within the overall partnership bid, not each project. And um, there's a couple now that I'll hand over to you for, Kath. Um, so with the sustainable grant element, can it be amortised over the 10-year uh, OP project period for reduced running cost outputs? So the example here is if there was a 100,000 uh, pound sustainable grant, could it be repaid back at 7.5, um, 7,500 pounds per year? Thanks, Anna, and thanks very much for that question. Um, it's a really interesting question, and I'm afraid I'm not able to provide an answer, a full answer to that here. However, I suggest we take that question back and um, get an answer out within the next couple of days, unless uh, Chris or James or any other colleagues on the call wanted to input into that. I think I would suggest that that is a good one to take back. Thanks, Emma. I, I, I can have a go at that, Emma, if that's helpful. Great, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> oh, good, good morning, all. Mike Harries, I'm the um, 
regional programme manager for the North West region, work, working alongside James, who you heard from earlier. Um, the, the approach in the past for um, repayment of, of the sustainable grant has been um, a repayment schedule can be agreed. In this, in this round, because it's trigger event driven, the question will be, what, what's the nature of the trigger? Certainly, I've got a project in the last round where all of the benefits are revenue, and therefore the repayment, even under the old rules, is coming in over three years. So speak to us if you've got ideas of things that are a slower repayment, but it certainly wouldn't exclude a project would be my steer at this point. Don't, don't discount yourself, but just explain why you think it needs to be done over a given period. Thanks very much, Mike. Sorry, yeah, yeah, to to yeah, yeah, that that uh, absolutely. And I would just um, repeat as well and just reinforce that in terms of any any suggestions, any ideas you have, then please do discuss them in the first instance with your regional team. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Great. And a sort of linked question: um, beyond the disposal of assets, what other circumstances can you we envisage um, milestones? being met that would require the sustainable grant to be paid. Now we've just discussed reduced running costs, which would obviously be one. Um, I'm not sure if Kath or anyone else would like to come in with any other examples. Thanks, Anna. Um, well, in terms of um, any trigger event, we would be looking for probably something where there would be um, it the, any capital receipt would be realised, for example, where uh, a disposal of an asset um, or maybe a lease event where you were, there was a termination of a lease, there was an opportunity to come out of a lease where that would release some, some funds, re reduce running costs effectively, um, or where maybe you was there was a proposal to co-locate within um another a another asset which would then free up other assets which would then again similarly release capital receipts or reduce running costs so um that's the kind of thing um that we would seek to um identify as a trigger a trigger event um i don't know if anybody else wants to add add into that colleagues Kath, can I can I add add to that? So, so a potential other scenario. Um, think think about your your route to delivery of the OPE project as as well. So so in in the same way that um, when you're partnering um, with a uh, development partner, you might seek to recoup revenue costs uh, from that development partner that you've incurred up front. Um, equally, the same could be true for the the uh, recycled. Uh, the recycled sustainable grant. So, um, thinking about your your total revenue costs, and obviously um, OP funding is is one of those. Um, what's your what's your route to delivery that might enable uh, recycling back into the national program? Thanks, James and Kath. Um, we had a couple of questions, uh, or people just noting the move from 25% up to 75% sustainable grant. Um, so I thought it might be helpful if we kind of talk a bit about the, the, the journey and the story behind that move. Um, one person particularly noting that, um, does this highlight a focus uh, shifting away from the disposal of capital assets and more towards initiatives that retain capital assets that create a revenue stream? I think you're on mute, Kath. Mute, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's a really interesting question and, and clear that it, it is quite a significant and substantial change from previous rounds of funding. Um, very much, as I said earlier, the, the, the reason behind it and the, the thinking behind um, this change in the of funding model is very much to ensure that we may maximize the impact of the public sector funding that enables us to recycle that into 
um, other projects into into the future so that it's enabling the, the programme generally, nationally, on a national basis to become sustainable, to enable, as I say, that funding to come back through um, and to be able to fund projects moving forward. Um, there is, as, as um, Mike referred to earlier, there's a range of different ways and opportunities that that funding can come back through, into flow back through and be recycled into the programme. So again, it's very much a case of um, discussing individual circumstances with your regional teams. Um, any colleagues want to add anything onto that? Shall I, shall I just pick up on, the, um, on that shift to to sort of revenue streams and and, and what have you. So um, uh, I don't um, I, I don't think this is sort of this is indicative of, of government shifting to that. That that your your again your your route to delivery and what you do with the asset, sort of your priorities locally, will determine that. Um, and um, we we've seen um, even under previous OP phases a, a number of routes where assets may be retained and 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 they. Um, they generate um, a revenue stream um, and um, in the same way you can still deliver housing um, that in itself um, uh, delivers a, a revenue stream so, so it, it's not that we're, we're asking you to shift to a, a, a different delivery route that that depends on on what your own partnership priorities are for each of the organizations Thanks, both. Um, just conscious of time, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead to some quick answer ones, and if you have time, I'll, I'll come back. Um, if one application form is needed per project, is it necessary to, necessary to put the partnership story and gateway criteria in each one? If the answer is yes, please. Um, appreciate that may seem um, a bit laborious, but it would be greatly appreciated by the assessors. Um, another question, a about partnership program management funding yes you are able to ask for that within your bid um, and partnerships should discuss their plans with their op regional team in the first instance and just to note that sustainable grant um, is not available for program management awards um, there was a question about is there an acceptable percentage of grant um, that I'll just put out to Kath and others if you'd like to pick up on that. Sorry, Emma, could you just repeat the question? Sorry, yeah. yeah. Within programme management um, funding, is there an acceptable percentage of grant, so i.e. 20% of the total grant ask? In answer to that, um, that there's no hard and fast rules. Um, again, we would refer you back to your regional team to have that conversation, have that discussion. Um, as I think Emma referred to earlier, the, the programme management funding is not um, available for as part of the sustainable grant funding. And you'd need to discuss that, the implications of that through with your regional teams. Great, thanks very much, Kath. And then two questions. Um, about the mix of local government and central government um, each project we need to have a mix of local government and central government partners um, there was one question i'm not sure if it was in relation to op or self and custom build but i'll answer it from an ap perspective and then maybe kate can pick it up from the self and custom build perspective uh, the question was um, is it restricted to local authority owned land only what about nhs owned land for ope um, it doesn't have to be local authority owned land. As mentioned, we would want each project to have a mix of local government and central government partners. Um, and if I've got time to sneak in one more, if Chris gives me <laughs> an indication. Um... Yeah, that's fine, Anna. You could do another Great. one. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, there was a question specifically about local industrial strategies that we make reference to in the strategic case. Uh, someone's noted that um, a lot of these, if they have been published, are now probably very out of date. Um, and just what approach would we recommend there? 
That's a really good question and do appreciate, obviously, the circumstances that a majority of local authorities are in at the moment and the rest of the public sector come to that as, as they're coming out of um, the post-pandemic recovery. Um, what we would say is certainly refer to by way of background those strategies that you have in place. And I'm sure that most, the, very, the vast majority of local authorities and organisations will have at least considered in some initial um, post-COVID recovery economic plans. So it's kind of, it's up to you really as a partnership to, um, to identify which strategies, which documents, which strategic plans um, are most appropriate to support the individual project and indeed the, the wider um, improvements and strategic direction of travel, which reflect the um, central government levelling up agenda, etc., innovation, zero carbon agenda, etc. Hope that hope that helps. Thanks very much, Kath. And one final question. Um, we make reference to partnerships telling us what would happen without the funding, but can this also include um, what wouldn't happen without the funding, i.e. Um, Without the funding, nothing would happen, but a lot could happen with the funding. And yes, um, that would be that would be fine if anyone else has anything they'd like to input into that. No. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. I will hand over to Kate. Thank you, Emma. So I'm Kate now going to pick. Sorry, no, Kate, you're going to pick up on something custom build, aren't you? Question. Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, so hello, I'm Kate from the Northwest team. Um, and so just in the first question we had was around local authority land ownership and unlike OPE, which can be both central and local government owned, for, the, for self and custom build is restricted to local authority owned land. Um, a couple of questions around levelling up, understandably, and um, the first one was around defining levelling up. So I'll ask James to comment on that in a moment. Um, and how those with lower land values might meet the challenge in the BCR of reflecting levelling up and have previously struggled with um, lower land values in that area. James, I'm going to pass over to you for that one. Thank you, Kate. Um, so so in, in, in terms of in terms of levelling up, um, we're, we're, we're not sort of we're not going to provide a, 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 a definition that, that constrains people. As, as we said earlier, it's it's about the geographic inequality. So for instance, um, I think there was a question about OP levelling up, but it would apply equally to, to self and custom build. Um, what is it about um, the, the project that helps address that geographic inequality? So, so for, um, for, for OP, for instance, if you're delivering a, a health project or an education project, um, are there, um, are there Sort of health inequalities in the in the region, sub-region, locality. Um, is there um, sort of uh, lower educational attainment, for instance? Um, and in the case of housing, um, where you're delivering housing as part of your project, um, that could be, for instance, um, that there's a pressure on affordability. So, so affordable housing pressures in in the area. Um, so, so this isn't this isn't about um, a, a, a north-south divide or a regional split, it's about articulating the case for the locality in which your project is, is, is situated. Um, and then um, in terms of the, um, the question about the, the economic output, so the benefit cost ratio for uh, self and custom build projects, um, we, 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 recognize, we recognize the challenge, we recognize that a gateway BCR of one um, is is still a struggle in in areas of lower land value uplift. Um, what um, what what we've done through through the previous and and this current round is introduce non size benefits. So so once you get past that that BCR of one, please do can consider those and and how you can you can get to the the one point five and a maximum score with your BCR plus non size benefits. And then in terms of the um, BCR of one, um, I'd, I'd really encourage you to, to, to sort of to play with the technical annex. So, so um, the number of housing, the, the profile of your housing, and also the, the amount of grants that you're requesting all affects that, that benefit cost ratio. 
as your as your as does your additionality so so think about the the impact of those inputs on bcr and do also um sort of we we in the regional teams are, are very happy to run through sort of run through those with you um to see where there might be opportunity to for you to make an application Thanks, Dave. So focus on NMBs and testing the technical annex are what I took away from that. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything on levelling up or shall we move on? Yeah, right. Um, the next question we had was around the definition of self and custom build. And we have got a set definition that's on the FAQ of the website. And the question was specifically around the role of the um, occupier and using that as counting the definition of self and custom build. And in the definition, there is some flexibility. It's not an exhaustive list, but um, we do take into account the role of the owner in design and layout of the original scheme. Um, so if you refer to that on the FAQ. Any other input there, James? I think, um, uh, so, um, Spotting that that question about um, occupier input on on design specification, so um, it's it's got to be more than um, sort of uh, the the input on design that that you'd have at sort of choosing a, a home off plan. So so it's not about um, it's more than sort of choice of the the fittings and and the the, the decoration and, and and the kitchen. For instance, um, but but the as Kate says, the, the FAQs have got a bit more detail, and and again, sort of encourage you to talk to your regional teams about how how you meet that uh, SCB or custom builds definition. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, James. We had another round, another question on if an options analysis is needed to substantiate additional economic benefits. And for self and custom build, um, supporting information should provide evidence of market failure and additionality scores. And you can also provide additional evidence um, that you think will support um, the case for economic benefits. Um, Sally mentioned some of those in her presentation, which we can pick up offline via Sally. Um, was there any addition, additional to add there, James? Um, I agree, agree with all of that, Kate. Um, I mean, uh, an option sort of an options analysis could could be the evidence you you provide but but it's by no means absolutely necessary so so we wouldn't we wouldn't anticipate that all projects have got options analysis to to indicate their wider social welfare benefits at this stage thanks james and that brings us on to our final self and custom build question um in using the self and custom build register how can we demonstrate end user consultation if we don't know who the end user will be. I think possibly this might be one for the expertise of Sally and we could take that outside of meeting um, given the time. But does anyone want to comment comment on that, James? Or I I, I think I think uh, my um, uh, initial initial reaction to that is that the the register identifies your your need for, for self and custom build plots in the in the locality. Um, it doesn't actually um, uh, provide evidence that the occupiers will be influencing the design that that is dependent on your your route to market and your your delivery route, if that makes sense. So um, given given that that land has to be released by September 2024, we, we would expect applicants to, to to be able to articulate how that land is going to be released and the route to those ultimate occupiers. So, so that's that's where you'd get the 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 evidence that it is self or custom build plot. Thanks, James. And just one final question around issues with duplicate funding for self self custom build sites. I believe they work in conjunction together. Um, does that reflect your understanding? That's yes, that's correct. So um, within the technical annex, um, there is um, opportunity for you to detail the the other government funding, central government funding, that's going into um, into the site that takes it up until the point of land release. So so for for this funding, um, there's 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 no issue with other government funding going in there. Um, it will depend on the terms of your funding agreements that you've got for other public funding. So you'll want to check check that. Um, but um, yeah, just just make sure you're profiling it within your your technical annex because it affects the benefit cost ratio. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
Thank you. I'll pass back to Chris. Thank you very much, Kate and Emma, for, for leading that session. And thank you for Kath, Mike and James for responding to some of the questions. So we've now come into the end of our workshop. Um, just want to say thank you for all the questions produced did, and I do appreciate that we didn't answer all the questions or all the questions weren't selected. What I can say is all the questions that have been posted today will be collated and any questions that are not already captured on the local government association website under one public estate frequently asked questions will be added to the document after the workshop. I hope you've all found the workshop useful today and it's provided you with the information required to submit a successful partnership funding application. If you have any further questions or potential project opportunities, then please contact your regional programme teams. Every presentation we've heard today, they've referenced the regional programme teams, so please contact. You will see them on the, this slide here. If in any doubt, look at the um, One Public Estate LGA website and their that the, the names of the and the telephone numbers and the email addresses of the contacts are on that uh, website. I'd like to say a big thank you for myself to Kath and James for leading us through one public estate and self in custody build funding application criteria, to Kate and Amal again for filling the questions, and in particular Sally Tag from the National Right to Build Task Force for leading us through some great examples of self in custody build delivery. But finally, thank you for attending the workshop. As a One Public Estate programme, we are really looking forward to receiving your One Public Estate and self and custom bill fund, funding applications. And I will say it again and loudly by the 8th of November deadline. So thank you very much, everybody. And the workshop is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>